Welcome back to Ancient Recipes. We're about to answer the most pressing question in all of our minds. Were there actually pancakes in King Tut's tomb? I know that's been keeping you up all night, so I'm here to help you. Oh, and of course, the way we're gonna do that is actually make the bread that was found in his tomb to see if they come out like pancakes or something else. Either way, they're gonna be good. If not, I may flip out. No? Okay, I'll stop. Hey there, I'm Sola Awili, and this is Ancient Recipes with Sola. In each episode, we take a dish you may recognize and attempt to recreate one of the oldest versions of it to ever exist. It's a little cooking, a little history, and a whole lot of me. What's not to love? To explain why I got obsessed and had to answer this question, when we were looking into the history of pancakes, search results kept saying they were found in King Tut's tomb. Yeah, us too, mind blown. So we had to go on a mission to bake the tomb breads to see if they really are pancakes. But before we dive into King Tut's fave, we're gonna kickstart the episode and me with a bit of coffee. Egyptians tend to prefer Turkish style coffee, which is made of finely ground beans boiled in this copper jezve. Delicious. Coffee comes from Ethiopia with legends of it being first consumed dating back to 700 AD. But the coffee berries were originally eaten to get the caffeine benefits and not drunk like we're used to now. The first accounts of coffee being drunk go back to 13th century Yemen. From there, it quickly spread in popularity. What we're making today wasn't the only food item found in King Tut's tomb. In addition to all of the gold and jewels you normally envision, many pharaohs and royals were buried with food and provisions to get them through the afterlife. King Tut's tomb had around 50 wooden boxes holding different foods. Beef on the bone, ducks, geese, and a variety of small birds. These wooden boxes were even shaped like the food they contained. There were no fish, even though the Egyptians ate a lot of fish, because these pharaohs wanted to be buried with the most high-class and expensive foods. It's almost as if they saved the best meal for their afterlife. Don't ask me why. I think you should eat it all while you can. They also found a few semi-circled breads intact in King Tut's tomb. These breads were found to contain coriander and another additive. This recipe we're recreating is very much an educated guest piecing together learnings from hieroglyphics, archeological finds from King Tut's tomb, and some writings from our good old friend, the Roman historian, Pliny the Elder. Ciao. But we do know they added in some goodies just like we do now. Instead of chocolate chips and bananas, they added in things like coriander and lotus flowers. To get started, we're gonna smash. Here I've got some emmer wheat. This is a wheat that you would commonly find in Egypt at the time, and we do still use it today. When we were doing research for this episode, we found out that it's the same thing as farro. So you may have had this wheat, and I'm gonna grind it into a flour. It's not ancient recipes without a good smash session. We're gonna keep the hull on, the hull and the germ. So it's gonna be a nice, hearty, whole wheat flatbread slash pancake. There are breads from ancient Egypt that contained lotus seeds. Pliny the Elder even writes about a bread made from just crushed lotus seeds and milk. King Tut was buried with multiple baskets of lotus flowers, so we're gonna make a bit of an assumption and guess to say that the other unknown additive in the bread is lotus seeds. My goal here is to get it as fine as possible. And the, the emmer is actually pretty brittle and it's not taking too much effort to get there. I think these lotus seeds are gonna make a great addition. And the lotus seeds are exactly what it sounds like. When you look at a lotus flower, it's right from the middle and you just pop them out. These big pearls, they're right out of the flower. It's covered in this green outer coating that you peel off and you have this seed. If you're gonna eat them raw, there's a little germ in the center that's kind of bitter. People usually take them out, but because we're going to crack these and add it to a pancake and cook it, we can leave the germ in. All right, that looks like we're in a good spot. Wow, it was a lot of work before to have flour. Nowadays, we're using pancake mix. Okay, so here are my lotus seeds. They kind of fly around when smashing, so I'm gonna be a bit gentle. Yeah, there we go. Whoops, we lost one. 
The oldest known evidence of a kind of pancake actually goes back 5,300 years to the oldest known natural mummy, Otzi the Iceman. He was found frozen in the Alps in 1991. He's given researchers a lot of insight into what life was like around 3,300 BCE. He was also so well preserved that scientists were able to analyze the contents of his stomach to find out what his last meal was. There was some dried meat and einkorn wheat. There is some debate whether the einkorn would have been eaten as a porridge or as a pancake. Just think, pancakes could be prehistoric. That's pretty cool. Oops. Okay, that looks good. It's still a little bit coarse, which feels right, because it's a mix-in, right? And now, some coriander. This will be very easy to smash, just a little crack. Some of you may remember we have used lotus seeds before in the Ninja Ball episode. I do remember the Ninja Balls were surprisingly delicious. Two out of three were. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. Just a light smash. I'm done. Coriander grinding. <laughs> Relatively, the coriander is so much easier to smash. I just cracked them all open, so we have little pops of texture. Welcome back. We're gonna make the bread that was found in King Tut's tomb. So far, we've done a lot of grinding the wheat, the lotus seeds, the coriander. So we're all ready to start pulling this recipe together. In goes our emmer wheat. And I'm gonna add my lotus flower seeds, the coriander, a little bit of salt, and it all gets mixed together with milk and a bit of warm water. All right, right now, it's a lot like a pancake. If I were making a pancake though, there would be a bit of baking powder and baking soda. So I'm imagining this will be a touch dense but what's an ancient recipe without being a little dense, right? I'm gonna stir this up. There are records of over 15 different kinds of breads from ancient Egypt. Archaeologists have found fossilized triangular breads, breads shaped into animals, breads shaped into leaves, breads even made purely of figs. The ancient Egyptians kept such good records of their baking. This awesome mural from the tomb of Ramses III shows an entire bakery and these sculpted figures showing the baking process. Now this looks like pancake batter. I forgot on the water. It's okay, you got it on the water. <laughs> While preparing for this episode, I had time to chat with Mena El Dori. She's a food archeologist and Egyptologist who was also guest editor for Egypt's heritage review, Rawi's Food Issue. Hi Mena, thank you for joining us. I'm very excited to learn more about ancient Egyptian food. It's not something we've explored yet here on Ancient Recipes. First question I wanted to ask you is, what are some of the foods that have been found entombed with pharaohs or other Egyptian royalty? A lot but it's not just the foods that we found in the tombs. We have, of course, foods from tombs, including bread and dried fruits like grapes and figs. And um, we have a type of a, a palm that's slightly different to date palm that has big fruits called dom, a dom palm. And we have a lot of that in addition to different kinds of meats, different cuts of meats and beef and uh, uh, different types of fowl and ducks and geese. But we also know a lot from what the regular people ate from the settlements where they lived, from the archaeological analysis and the archaeological excavations that we conduct. And that gives us a much wider range um, of foods that the ancient Egyptians in general would have, cons would have been consuming. So was there a really big difference between the food that the that the royalty was entombed with versus what the common people were eating? Yes. So the royalty would have, in general, had a lot more access to beef and access to wine, which was a more expensive commodity, while the average Egyptian would have been eating more um, grains and fish and, and uh, pork. 
but also what you were buried with was not necessarily what people ate on a daily basis. So mm. we have some kinds of foods that we find a lot where people lived, like lentils, but we almost never find in the tombs. So it wasn't very representative. It was like the most exa- extravagant, like it's their, it's their favorite like fantasy meal that they're entombed with. Maybe their favorite foods, the most prestigious foods that they wanted to ensure that they would have in the afterlife. We can't really get in their heads and know why they picked these foods and whether it was sort of a standard menu that just everyone got or depending on the season or whatever. Or was there a very conscious personal decision? This is what I want you to bury me with when I die. Mm -hmm. So around the time of King's Hut, what would the average Egyptian's diet look like? Although ancient Egypt spanned about three, 4,000 years, there's in some cases, in terms of food, not much change. So mm. in, in the time of King Tut, bread would have been, as always, the cornerstone of the diet. Beer would have been, as always, a very thick, nutritious drink that people would have been drinking slash eating because it was quite rich and quite thick. Um, in addition to... Lentils, these were very important. We found these on sites across the country from all kinds of different contexts, from different time periods. In addition to the animal proteins I mentioned, fish and and, uh, geese and ducks and maybe pigeons and quails and then pork, beef for occasions and, and celebrations. In addition to some kinds of green vegetables, le- um, lettuce, spring onions were incredibly popular. Just like they are today, we find lettuce and spring onions on every single breakfast, lunch, and dinner table in, uh, in Egypt. As well as fruit, of course. They would have had fruit, dates, and uh, around the time of King Tut, pomegranates were introduced, but we also had, always we had um, figs and grapes. So it sounds like a very rich variety of I mean I would want to eat that diet now sounds fantastic thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me real quick enjoy I'm glad to to have chatted with you about that welcome back we're gonna make the bread that was found in King Tut's tomb okay dough is ready now next we're gonna grill this on a flat cooking top this is one thick batter. So I imagine we're gonna need to go at more of a moderate heat so it can cook through. Yeah. Another little dollop. Let's get, I think I can fit three on here. It is a really dense, thick dough because of that whole emmer wheat. But I imagine because we've got those like crunchy, lotus seeds in there that might actually lighten it up. Ancient Egyptians would have baked or fried their pancakes and breads in a few different ways. They would have griddled their flatbreads on a flat stone surface over open fire. They also had cone-shaped breads using a very specific ceramic mold that was buried in the ground surrounded by coals. By the time the New Kingdom period started, the Egyptians had started to use cylindrical tube above ground ovens. They would place fire at the bottom of it and then put the dough on the side of the tube to bake. Today we're using this cast iron griddle pan to get as close as we can to their cooking surface. When I'm normally cooking a pancake, I'm looking for some bubbles to pop on the surface. That's how you know that the heat's come through and the center is cooked. This dough is quite thick, so I don't know if I'm gonna get the same vibe, but I am seeing like there's a bubble there. There's a bubble there. The base is nice and set. I'm gonna let it cook a little bit longer, but I think we're close to flip time. I was worried about stickage, but look at that slide. I think we're ready to flip one. Well, doesn't that look dense? (laughs) These are very dense, very hearty. I imagine one could sustain you for a really long time, maybe even the entire afterlife. So they definitely feel like flat bread. It'll be interesting to taste it with the texture, but right now, flat bread. This may be basic knowledge at this point, but Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922. It's the most well-known tomb because of how many items he found and how well-preserved they were. 
Throughout antiquity, most of the Egyptian pharaoh tombs were raided with many things stolen. This tomb was the exception. Okay, I think we have our first batch ready. Let's try another one. A great hearty little short stack. Okay, I'm gonna keep going on my pancakes. Now these guys, I think they're ready. They're not ready. The fact that these are in King Tut's tomb, this means it's a favorite. So he, he likes these dense cakes. But I am getting like an aroma from the coriander, which is nice. Especially when I flip it and I get to the second side and the whole thing's warmed really through. This is my second batch and, and I do believe that my color has improved. It, it takes a few batches to really like nail that temperature to get to know your pan and your burner. Oh, all right, okay. I think we are ready for our breakfast. All right, it's pancake time. Although these are definitely more of a flatbread than a pancake. Those Google search results are stretching it, trying to group these in as pancakes. We're also gonna try these along with a spread of some other items that were also found mummified in King Tut's tomb. We've got figs, grapes, melons, and a whole beef stink. So I'm excited to dig in. Let's try our pancakes slash flatbreads first. Wow, dense. Not as bad as it looks. Not as dense as it looks, this is a surprise. I think because emmer wheat is lower in gluten than like the whole wheat flour we use today, it's actually not as dense and gummy as I thought. And that lotus flower seed did exactly what I thought it would. It breaks up the texture. And the smell of the coriander is really nice. Um, I haven't had it in a pancake like this. Let's try it with honey. This is actually pretty delicious. Wow, who knew? Who knew there was a reason why we want to be buried with this? I love it when there's an ancient recipe like this and like throughout the process, I'm like completely confused. I was wrong. This is great. I'm surprisingly into it. And with the honey, awesome. I don't know if I'd make pancakes like this at home exactly the same way, but I love a lot of the ideas that I've gotten from this, like the lotus flower bits and the coriander. And also adding a little emmer wheat into my regular pancake. Like I love the nuttiness and the flavor. So I feel like there's a lot to take away from this to add to my current modern pancake. And I love it when one of these recipes uh, teaches me something new like that. So should we get into our huge beef shank? Wow. I don't know why we don't roast a shank like this anymore. It's so dramatic. I feel like a Flintstone baby. Wow, nice and juicy. Okay. I mean, who doesn't love a hunk of properly roasted meat? Always delicious throughout, throughout all of time. And we've got figs, we got melons, we got grapes. I think this is a wonderful spread. King Tut, he knew how to live. Great taste. Now we had to have a little bit of fun with this uh, ancient pancake. So we've got a little treat. an epic pyramid of pancakes. Now, that is a tall stack. Wow. That's a stack. <laughs> well, that was awesome. 
And I learned that I need to write what foods I want to be buried with into my will, that you can't really trust clickbait headlines, and that ancient Egyptians ate a very healthy diet. It's kind of amazing how food can instantly make you feel connected to past cultures and time periods. It's a little like a time machine of dough and sauce and sugar. There aren't many other things like it. See you next time. You guys know the deal by now. If you liked the episode, make sure to like and subscribe and check out other episodes down below. And if you have a vintage or ancient recipe you want us to try out, drop it in the comments. I always love to see them.